On their 1983 world tour, Charles and Diana went to Australia. And they also extended the tour and they included New Zealand as well. So it was a six week tour, which is a, is a long, long time. Diana described it as a baptism of fire. Ladies and gentlemen, the last time I was here was two years ago, uh, in 1981, shortly before uh, we were married. But at that time, everybody was saying, good luck and I hope everything goes well and how lucky you are. Be engaged to such a lovely lady, and my goodness, I was lucky enough to marry her. And uh, we had many, <laughs> many messages. It's amazing what ladies do when your back's turned. <laughs> We shall remember all those people who have welcomed us, who have stood for hours in rain or sun. We can only hope that we've given them something back, that we've given something back to the many individuals in, in the crowd. I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives <laughs> to have covered both sides of the street. <laughs> and I could have walked down the middle directing the operation. The purpose of a royal tour is to spread the word about Britishness and British goods and meeting important people in the host country or obviously combining it with uh, as much charity work as possible. And that's how royal tours have always been. They used to be much, much, much longer than they are now. But it's really about flying the flag for Britain. The princess had left her packing to the last minute, undecided as to which clothes to take with her, and no doubt adding some wet weather gear for Alice Springs. Still, the departure went smoothly. Among the farewell, Australia's High Commissioner, Sir Victor Garland, and Lady Garland. The British press have dubbed it the Royal Tour into the Unexpected, making much of the potential weather problems and the Republican leanings of Prime Minister Bob Hawke and as the prince has long been a familiar figure in Australia, there's no doubt in London that it will be the princess and her baby who capture the limelight in the weeks ahead. It will be May by the time they return to London after their Australian and New Zealand tour, and they'll then prepare for a similar tour of Canada in mid-June. After days of torrential rain in Alice, the skies were clear this morning as the Royal Australian Air Force jet made its approach. The flight to Alice Springs from London was a direct one, with only one refueling stop, a place kept secret for security reasons. After a wait of several minutes, the prince and princess emerged, showing no sign of the long flight, and obviously well educated in the right sort of clothes to wear in central Australia. The line of dignitaries was a short one for their arrival. Military officials, the new Federal Minister of State, Mick Young, and his wife, and the Northern Territory Chief Minister, Paul Everingham, with his wife. And then the moment more than 100 reporters and cameramen flew from all over the world to see. 
the public debut of nine-month-old Prince William, second in line to the throne. A barrage of cameras and recorders was reduced to chaos as the royal nanny, Miss Barbara Barnes, brought Prince William down the stairs. His first public showing was to be in the airport terminal building, but media officers decided the scores of camera flashes would be too much for the baby prince. Instead, it was a brief trip to the tarmac and then a pose for the cameras with mum and dad. Prince William was then whisked back aboard the plane and taken straight to Albury and the nearby Woomagama station, where he'll spend his entire time in Australia. No royal baby had ever been on a royal tour before, so it was very unusual that, that Prince William should, should accompany his parents, but they were invited. It, it wasn't their idea. Uh, they didn't even, you know, the, the Prime Minister of Australia thought what a good idea, and it was a brilliant idea. And Prince William actually stayed at a, a, a sort of farm homestead with, you know, with his nanny and with his protection officer, so he, he wasn't dragged around behind Charles and Diana, who was very much in his own place. The prince and princess then made their way through the crowd as hundreds of necks were stretched to get a glimpse over the heads of the media. The royal couple stopped several times to chat with the crowd, some of whom had driven hundreds of kilometers for this moment. And then, with great difficulty, the crowd was parted as they got into their car and made off for the Gap Hotel, which is to be their home for two nights. Yet another crowd of about 500 waited all morning outside the hotel for one glimpse of the couple. Briefly, very briefly, they did see Prince Charles slip across the balcony from one room to another, but that was all. When the prince and princess did leave about an hour and a half later, they did so quietly and unnoticed out of a back door. Their first task of the day was to open the new St. John Ambulance Regional Centre in Alice Springs, a centre built to cater for 35,000 people, an area of some 800,000 square kilometres. But we thought it was rather appropriate to start here in the, in the centre of Australia. After all, the centre of the wheel is what helps the spokes from the outside to go round. And, uh, It's good to be in the Northern Territory. It is fitting that the first engagement should have been to the School of the Air, where the children of the Outback are educated. In the studio, the princess had her joke with the press corps, then to the serious business. Education by radio exists for children who live in remote areas like the Ormiston Gorge, a hundred miles from Alice. And then there was a question and answer session revealing some minor royal secrets. Question. What is Prince William's favorite toy? Um, Jamie, he loves his koala bear he's got. But he hasn't got anything particular. He just likes something with a bit of noise. Um, he got a plastic whale that throws things at the top, little balls. <laughs> Thank you. Question, Jamie, how many rooms are there in Buckingham Palace? I haven't actually counted them. Uh, and even if I did, I dare say there'd be quite a lot that uh, people didn't know about, um, that somebody had been living in for many years unbeknownst to anybody else. Question, are you going to get a horse for Prince William? I expect we will. In England, we have something called the, a Shetland pony, which is just a little bit smaller than a, your idea of a pony. So we probably will one day, hopefully, just to encourage him. There were photographs of Diana looking sad, and I think when they po posed in front of Ayers Rock, um, they looked very apart, although they were standing together. And I think perhaps that, I think there was an element of sadness that was showing in the pictures. I mean, we can only tell by the, the, the close-ups that photographers were taking at the time. And I think there was 
an element of something not being right or Diana looking really miserable uh, uh, and uh, they, they, it wasn't like they, they didn't have any sort of togetherness. The third day of the royal visit took the Prince and Princess of Wales to Tennant Creek over an hour's flight north of Alice Springs in the centre of the Northern Territory. Here they were shown the Kalguru Primary School. Princess Diana was again given more roses and daffodils than she could handle. The schedule, normally followed to the minute, this time was thrown out of the window. The royal staff, concerned about the withering heat outside, allowed the tour inside to last an hour. Princess Diana obviously felt more at home with the young children than she has for most of the visits so far. The first stop was at Canberra's Civic Centre, which has an uncanny resemblance to Croydon. After the days in the outback, the crowd seemed enormous, and the walkabout was busy with morning shoppers and Canberra's civil servants. She chatted to housewives, who were able to observe that her outback sunburn has faded now that she's in the cooler climate of the east. Small hands reached out to hug her by the waist. Today's visit was not on the original schedule for Charles and Diana, but they'd expressed a wish to see the areas where the fires had caused so much destruction and heartbreak. After being shown the extent of all the Victorian fires on a map, they met a number of the emergency service personnel who had spent Ash Wednesday in the Cockatoo area. The local CFA men presented Prince Charles with their last helmet, suitably inscribed Cockatoo, March 1983, a time they'll never forget. Then, further along the line, they continued to chat, and it wasn't all small talk either. At the end, they planted a flowering gum tree as a symbol of faith in Cockatoo's recovery. On their arrival at Stirling Oval, the royal couple were met by an army of loyal admirers. A virtual wall of people flanked both sides of the main walkway to the sporting ground, where country fire service personnel and the many victims of the recent fires and floods had gathered. The official party, led by Premier John Bannon and his wife Angela, were on hand to meet Prince Charles and Princess Diana and to escort them through to the main arena. The long walk provided a perfect opportunity for many of the general public to meet the royal couple. Young children offered flower poses to both the visitors. One imaginative youngster felt the prince should sample one of the country's more interesting exports, a jar of that truly Australian spread Vegemite. 
After initial chats with members of the public, it was time for the main event of the day, the meeting with those who experienced the full fury of the disasters that swept the state. Such was their interest in the plight of many of the victims that the royal couple spent an hour listening to the various accounts of those who went through the ordeals. The visitors then left for a brief tour of the Green Hill area where six people died. After that, it was on to Adelaide Airport for their flight to Albury in New South Wales. I have been here many times before, but I do genuinely feel that I am among old and valued friends. Old because it is now 17 years, believe it or not, since I first set foot as a hesitant pom in this vast and exciting land. The royal party was only four minutes behind schedule when they arrived at the Sheraton Wentworth Hotel to the cheers and a few screams from excited royal watchers. Shortly before eight, the prince and princess entered the ballroom and the evening's festivities began. It all began formally enough, but the band was warming up. The tune, The More I See You. Albury was delighted to be playing host to the royal couple at the extra special Easter Sunday service at St. Matthew's Anglican Church. From early this morning, thousands from the River City and surrounding areas gathered outside the church, waiting for just a glimpse of the prince and princess who'd been relaxing at nearby Woomagama. About 300 parishioners crammed into St. Matthew's as the couple took Holy Communion and the prince read a passage from the New Testament. Albury had turned on perfect weather for Charles and Diana as they strolled through the city square after the service. Their walkabout lasted 20 minutes, and to the delight of the 12,000 eager onlookers, the royal couple chatted freely to the select few, and the princess's ever-growing posy collection was given its daily rejuvenation. The reception in Australia was just phenomenal, and I think it was quite, you know, quite frightening because people went crazy and they were sort of screaming. I mean, in, in, a, in a very nice way, but I think it's something that, that no one had ever experienced before or, or, or quite knew how to handle. And, and so it was a phenomenon that they just had to deal with on a daily basis. By contrast, it was cold and wet for the royal couple's return to Sydney this afternoon. They were greeted at Warwick Farm by Prince Charles' great friend and ex-polo instructor Sinclair Hill and Mrs. Hill. A quick snack, and Prince Charles was off to select his four horses for the ensuing polo match, giving Princess Diana the opportunity to have a royal matter with one of her ex-London flatmates. Prince Charles, just exiting quietly. To those who were brave enough to play uh, on my side, which is dangerous enough, those who uh, gave us a wonderful opposition, knocked me off my horse. <laughs> Reactions on knocked off. <laughs> and um, also uh, for those people who think that I just fall off all the time. The first stop was at Renmark on the bend of the river, where they grow citrus fruits and some presentable wines. But for today, the only business was trying to shake the princess's hand or attempt to photograph the prince. The couple went to a school sports day involving 7,000 children, which required a vast number of races to settle the matter. 
When the prince eventually did the prize giving, the last winner, a 16-year-old school captain, took her prize and asked if the princess would mind if she kissed him. In 1983 was absolutely the height of Diana mania. They'd been married for two years. She'd given birth to Prince William. He was almost two years old. And people were just, it was just like a phenomenon. I mean, people would scream when they saw Diana. It was almost like Beatle mania, but it was Diana mania. And, and, and Charles felt, you know, it, an irrelevance. And he didn't like it, he wasn't used to it. He'd been brought up since the moment he opened his eyes that he was, he was the one, he was the future, he was gonna be the king. And suddenly he's been completely overtaken by this gorgeous young wife who everybody wanted to see and everybody wanted to shake her hand. Brisbane was the place where they expected the biggest crowds of the tour and they got them. When the royals finally arrived to be greeted by Lord Mayor Roy Harvey and Mrs. Harvey at about 11.45, the excited crowd was like a bomb ready to explode. Children rushed to the royal couple with scores of bouquets, and barriers came down to create a security and police nightmare. But the prince and princess seemed undaunted and took time to chat and accept the tumultuous cheers from the crowd. Vantage points were the thing. You could climb on the telephone box or on a traffic light, on a window ledge, or at the very top of a building but wherever they were, most of them were noticed. Nearing the town hall, the prince still looked nervous about the crowds, but safely inside, the couple signed the visitor's book. Charles was, you know, is a, a, a university graduate, a great deep thinker, a great deep reader. And Diana is, uh, you know, she, she got very few qualifications. So she wasn't a well-read, intelligent woman. She was very canny and very smart, but she wasn't at all like Charles. They were, they were polar opposites. We've been now all the way around Australia to every single state. And this certainly has been the coldest day of the entire expedition. They returned to Melbourne as a family to enable them to depart Tullamarine and Australia tomorrow together to begin their New Zealand tour. As Charles and Diana posed for a photograph with the RAAF flight crew, baby William was carried off the plane by nanny Barbara Barnes. Flight crew told me the little prince traveled quite well, no problems and no crying spells, and he was seated in a child restraint in the rear seat between the prince and princess for the drive to government house. I think Diana was actually delighted that, that she could have William with them, even though he wasn't there. And obviously it was sad and difficult for her not to have him. She did say, but at least we were under the same sky. And she wasn't worried about him. And also it gave her a lot to talk about. So, you know, she always used to say, she used to say to me, I talk about the latest TV programs I've seen, and I watch them so I can talk to people in the street, but she could talk to people about William. What's he doing? What's his favorite toy? There was all that kind of thing, and it really helped her. Prince William stole the show at today's airport farewell arriving at Tullamarine with his nanny, Barbara Barnes, 45 minutes before his parents. 
which should have given him plenty of time to settle down in a specially built wall-mounted cot for the flight across the Tasman. But Prince William preferred to bounce around his aircraft nursery, delighting photographers with his waves out of the small aircraft window. Prince Charles and Princess Diana were on royal time again, late, and had no time for a personal farewell to the crowds at Tullamarine. A wave goodbye from the doorway of the New Zealand Air Force jet, and the Australian tour was over. A high proportion of all the children of Auckland were at Eden Park. In fact, the total was 35,000, about the crowd they get for a test match here. But the display couldn't begin until the Maori challenge was accomplished. Maori children are taught their racist ceremonies very early in life. It's not rudeness to stick your tongue out, but the mark of a true warrior. Even so, the princess didn't seem entirely sure. The test of a stranger's intentions is to put a stick in front of them. Friendly people pick it up. If it's left on the ground, that means war. The prince came in peace. After that, it was safe to rub noses, the traditional greeting. The path to the boathouse was muddy and treacherous. The princess tried the grass instead of the stones, but that wasn't much help. A certain amount of concentration now went into staying upright. The prince showed concern and made one of his photographic jokes. It was here in Wellington that the walkabout was invented 15 years ago. Now it's become the largest royal growth industry. Although they took baby William, he wasn't with them all the time. And it was incessant. It was absolutely incessant. And Diana got thinner and thinner, and her bulimia we got worse and worse and worse. And Charles got more and more and more jealous, because all everybody wanted to do was see Diana, because she was his new bride. So it wasn't surprising. But he didn't like it. So, you know, the serious cracks started to appear in their relationship. The prince realizes now that he's taking second place and doesn't mind. He knows it's the princess people have come to see. In Upper Hutt, they cheered when she switched sides of the road. They chanted for her and cheered again when the prince chose her direction. Ladies and gentlemen, the last time I was here was two years ago, uh, in 1981, shortly before uh, we were married. Uh, at that time, everybody was saying, good luck, and I hope everything goes well, and how lucky you are. To be engaged to such a lovely lady, and my goodness, I was lucky enough to marry her. And uh, we had many, <laughs> many messages. Amazing what ladies do when your back's turned.
They came to Waitangi in the Bay of Islands on this last day of the tour to pay their respects at the place where New Zealand became a nation. We shall remember all those people who have welcomed us, who have stood for hours in rain or sun. We can only hope that we've given them something back, that we've given something back to the many individuals in, in the crowd. And I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives <laughs> to have covered both sides of the street. <laughs> and I could have walked down the middle directing the operation. In these six weeks, the Princess of Wales has probably become the world's most photographed woman. It must have been an ordeal, but she's rarely shown it. She's responded to adulation with modesty and spirit. The monarchy will be the benefactor. And there were, of course, the clothes, fashioned with a completely individual flair. 50 outfits in 42 days. Do you find it a very daunting experience that uh, yesterday you were a nanny looking after children, um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales, and, and one day you would all, in all likelihood be queen? It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden, the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. I don't think it really sank in. She was very naive, and I think she thought, oh, one day I'll be queen, fine. But um, I think it was really more the pressure of being on such public display that got to her, and I think that's the pressure that gets to every girl that marries into the royal family. But no one had ever experienced this before. Diana was the first one. And I remember the queen sort of saying, it, this, you know, th it's just because she's young and new and it'll all calm down. Because it never calmed down, it just got worse. So she was under a lot of pressure. Now, if you watch that, that piece of footage when Prince Charles is asked, are you in love, sir? And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. Yes. And she looks at him as if to say, what are you talking about? Don't you know what love is? That was the problem from the beginning. But he was sort of being mystical, you know, which was a really stupid thing to say in an interview. 
don't want to start getting into whatever love is. He didn't mean it as unkindly as it sounded. He was just being a little bit sort of clever with the interview, but it backfired so badly. He never really wanted a lover. He wanted a mother. Well, the cracks in their relationship, I think they began to show very quickly because Diana didn't understand. I mean, after she, she became engaged to Prince Charles, he, he never seemed to be around. He was always so busy. And she was moved into Buckingham Palace and she had her own apartment there and he, he was sort of down the corridor. And she was absolutely on her own. Diana uh, had terrible jitters on her wedding day. In fact, the night before, she, she'd wanted to get out of the whole thing. And she'd had a sort of funny, jokey evening with her sisters. And they said, you can't get out of it now. Your face is on the tea towels. And that made her laugh. But she discovered about Camilla. She discovered that Charles um, was giving her gifts. And she didn't know the half of it, but she knew that Camilla was a very important person in her fiancé's life, and she, be, she says she became obsessed, ab absolutely obsessed, so that when she was walking down the aisle, she spotted Camilla in the, in the congregation. She says, but you know, the most wonderful thing was walking down the aisle of St Paul's Cathedral with my father. She says, but did you ever look at the footage of that? I said, I've seen it many times. She says, next time you look at it, watch me. She says, can't you see me looking? from side to side. Can you see me doing that? Do you know what I'm doing? I'm looking for her. I'm looking for Camilla. And she was there. <laughs>